I don't know what else I can do to help you. Give me that. Lots of it. That's not going to solve your problems. It's meant to distract from no them. No more preaching. Just give it to me. Lilith, please listen to what I'm saying. Says the Lord who created you, and he who formed you. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship today. We are so glad that you're joining us here this morning. Those of you that are here in this room with us, uh, it's great to see all of you. Those of you that are joining us online, and I know Waki is with us this morning and our local sites, we are so glad that every single one of you is worshiping with us today. We don't believe it's any accident that you're here with us. So welcome. We're glad you're here. Uh, my name is Amanda Neppel. I'm one of the pastors here. And as you can see, I have some of my sisters in Christ and co-laborers here at Hope. Uh, Corey Forsey and Anna Eckley uh, have been our pastoral interns here for the last several months and have a few more months to go on their internship. And so they have a word to share with you this morning as well. And it's so great to be able to uh, come to you together with the three of us sitting up here to talk with you a little bit based off of our Bible reading today, just about some of the women who follow Jesus and some of their stories and the impact that following Jesus, having an interaction with Jesus had on their life. And so you'll hear from Corey and Anna here in just a little bit. But before we do, I just kind of want to set some of the up for us this morning. That clip that you saw is from the TV show, The Chosen, uh, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And that particular part, that particular clip that you saw is an imagining of what it might have looked like, the interaction between Mary and Jesus when Jesus healed Mary. And um, you might have heard and been a little bit confused in the clip there, the bartender calls her Lilith or Lily. And it's just kind of an extra layer of meaning that the authors of the show put in there uh, because in Jewish folklore, the name Lilith uh, actually means uh, having to do with demons. And so, now listen, if your name is Lilith or if your name is Lily, <laughs> it's a beautiful name. <laughs> it's beautiful. And so in addition, it also reminds us of a beautiful spring flower. I mean, Easter lilies, Okay, so hang on to that definition. And then also maybe you have the winning trivia answer now in your back pocket at some point, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, you can tell from the way Mary is portrayed there, reasonably so, that before Mary has this interaction with Jesus, Mary has lost hope in her life. And everything 
that she has going on around her looks pretty dark and she's pretty full of despair until she has this encounter with Jesus. And we know from the scriptures that this is the story, this is what happens to a lot of people when they have an encounter with Jesus, men and women. It doesn't matter what their story was before. It's got all of us have a story, and everyone's potentially has joys and sorrows in it. Everyone's does. And then they meet Jesus, and then they are different after that. And that's certainly what happened to Mary. It happened to others as well. You can read about them in our Bible reading from today in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. Uh, we know that Mary Magdalene was there. Uh, we know that there were other women who were there who were following Jesus as well. Uh, and these were women who were married to powerful men, uh, men with influence and means. And so these women used some of their means then uh, to be able to support Jesus and his ministry and what Jesus uh, was doing with the disciples. And in Luke, it tells us that Jesus took the disciples and some of these women with him as they went on this tour uh, to towns and to villages. And I want you to understand, try and wrap your head around how revolutionary this was, because we have to take into account the context at the time. We just have to, or we're missing a big part of the story there. Because the truth of the matter is, if Jesus was trying to start a movement, and he were just anybody, and he's trying to start a movement, and he invites women into it, based Basically, that is the surest way to make sure that this movement just is completely forgotten, that it's laughed off the pages of history because that at that time simply absolutely positively was not done. And the only reason we know about it is because Jesus really is the Messiah. That's the only reason we are able to then read about this movement that had women associated with it. It was that revolutionary. And I know if you're like me, you might look at these verses and you might wish, you know, I wish that there was just more. I wish that we heard about more of these women because we know there were more of them and I'd, I'd like to hear more about them. And I get that. And I uh, look forward to eternity uh, to be able to talk to them and to, to find out the different things that happened uh, with them and the ways that Jesus showed up for them and, and all those different types of things. But for us today, as we kind of look at this, I just want us to keep in mind that the truth of the matter is we know that women were an integral part of what Jesus was doing because they were mentioned at all because of how revolutionary and how countercultural that was. And it's important for us to, to look at these women as we can see in our Bible reading today and understand that their, their participation with Jesus, it wasn't just like a begrudging thing where like, you know, you got a puppy dragging along behind and it's like, well, we're not gonna kick the puppy. I mean, I guess the puppy can follow us, right? It was not that. They were an integral part of what Jesus was doing. And in their participation with Jesus, it included verbs. It was things like following and studying and learning and serving and participating in all sorts of fundamental, meaningful ways. That's what we're here to share with you and uh, a little bit more today. Uh, so as we continue on, I just want to start because we're talking about Mary Magdalene. I just want to share a couple of things with you about her specifically and what I find so meaningful in this. There's a few things about Mary that we need to get straight from the very beginning. And a couple of them are kind of, uh, you know, not really important, but a couple of them are super important. So the first things I just kind of want to clear up for us, there can be some confusion about who Mary Magdalene is. A lot of us uh, potentially maybe think or have thought that Mary Magdalene is the same Mary who is the sister of Martha, who is also the sister to Lazarus. And Corey's going to help us with that here in a little bit. But these are actually different Marys. And I think that this mistake just comes naturally because there's a lot of Marys and they don't have last names in the way that we are used to. And so it's just an easy mistake to make to kind of lump them all in together. The second one, I think, is, and I don't even know if I really have to address this, but just on the off chance that I do, definitely not married to Jesus. And I think that um, that's not as innocent of a mistake. I feel like when that mistake gets made, it's kind of malicious because it's kind of sensational and it stirs the pot a little bit and potentially sells books and potentially sells movies. Uh, but Mary Magdalene, definitely not married to Jesus. Now here's some more important things that I want you to know about Mary. Every single one, of the gospel authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, every single one of them has Mary present at Jesus' crucifixion. As we said before, Mary was all in. She was an integral part of what Jesus was doing. There were plenty of other people who said they were all in, who on the day that Jesus was crucified were nowhere to be found. 
but Mary was there. Every single gospel author says so. And then on the next day, Matthew, Mark, and John tell us that uh, Mary was there at the empty tomb. And then they also tell us that Mary was of the first, the first people, person, excuse me, that Jesus appeared to. And not only did Jesus appear to Mary, but then Jesus said to her, Mary, go and tell your brothers, go and tell the disciples that I'm risen. And here's why this is so meaningful to me. A lot of you know that I grew up in a denomination that doesn't allow women to be pastors. And so when I experienced this call that I knew that God was calling me to lead in the church, I had a lot of internal wrestling that I had to do. Because while I'd never actually agreed with what they taught, uh, it had gotten into me because I'd spent so much time there. And so I'd had, I had to really wrestle with that call. And there are a lot of places objectively where you can get the information that, that women are called to lead. You can get that from Judges chapter 4. You'll read that next week if you're doing the Old Testament readings where we learn about Deborah who was called by God to be Israel's judge during that time frame. Uh, you can also look in Romans chapter 16 where you will see all of the women who are named specifically by Paul the women who he called to leadership to lead in those faith communities where they lived. So there are places where you can objectively see that women are called to lead. But for me in my heart, this reality and this truth that Jesus could have shown up to anyone. He could have shown up to literally anyone to tell them, to go tell the disciples. He could have shown up to the disciples himself. But to deliver the biggest news that the world had ever heard or would ever hear, mm -hmm. that he was alive. Jesus chose a woman whose story was not perfect to go and share this good news with the men who also needed to hear it. That was hugely healing for my heart when I was wrestling with that call. Uh, and so... Corey and Anna, we, you have uh, stories as well. There's women, uh, particularly in the New Testament, that speak to you that uh, have a word for every single one of us today. And so, Anna, why don't you go first? Who is someone that you want to share with us? Yeah. I am excited to talk about the prophetess Anna that we can find in Luke 2. So just as Pastor Amanda told us about Mary Magdalene, who was a part of Jesus' ministry and was even there at the end of Jesus' ministry, in a complete 180, we see Anna, who was there at the very, very beginning. So when Jesus was an infant, he was taken to the temple, and this is where we meet Anna, and we learn a little bit about her. And although we only get a few verses about her, we only get a small glimpse into her life, there's just so much more or so much that we can take away from it. So from scripture, we know that she is an older woman and she has been widowed for a really long time or she has been a widow for a really long time and she has been living in the temple. So at the time, a widow had a really low social economic status. They were kind of at the very bottom of the totem pole. So, but living in the temple allowed her to grow and have this faith, a devout faith in the Lord, which then allowed her to be the only named female prophetess that we see in the New Testament. And because of this, because she is the only named female prophetess and she's named in the Bible, we recognize her today, uh, that means that there's something that we should really look into here. Yeah, so, so we see that Anna is this prophet, this prophet who identifies Jesus when he's eight days old, right? And she's probably seen many infants come into the temple because that's normal when they're eight days old, but she knows immediately that this is Jesus. So what is it that you see that we can take away, that we can learn from Anna to, to be part of our own lives? Yeah, so she had a really great and deep faith. And when you live in a way that is continuously in worship of God, or when you live in a way like she got to live in a temple where you are just always seeing things from God, you can have this faith. So she had a great experience of recognizing things that were from God or things that wouldn't have been from God. And when she saw this baby, she was stopped in her tracks. And scripture says, Luke 2, 38, says she began praising God. And then she talked about the child to everyone who had been waiting expectantly for God to rescue Jerusalem. <clears throat> so she was stopped in her tracks. And this is so important because she was one of the first people to see Jesus and recognize who he was going to be. But she was the first woman to proclaim the good news yeah. by saying, this is the child 
that we have been waiting for. And to do this, she exercised this muscle of faith, this spiritual muscle that we also have access to, where we can discern whether things are from God or things that aren't from God. And here at Hope, when we get to exercise this muscle, we say, I think I'm getting this thing from God, but I'm also not sure if it's from the pizza I ate last night. So, but she had this muscle that was so strong that immediately when seeing Jesus as a baby, she knew this is from God. She activated this faith. She strengthened this muscle by being in continuous worship. And today we don't live in temple. We don't live on temple grounds, but we can also strengthen and activate this muscle by being in the word, being in God's word, or by living in community with people who are also discerning God's word. Or maybe if we're fasting for Lent, those are all things that are going to strengthen this muscle. So she demonstrates that there's this spiritual muscle and it's something that we should hold on to because we also have access to it in our own life today. Yeah, I love that, Anna. And it's just a good reminder because so many times people will say, you know, I don't think that I hear from God. I don't know when God's trying to speak to me. I don't know what it is that God wants me to do. And the truth of the matter is here we see from Anna and the way that she lived her life. Uh, she just spent her life listening to God. And it doesn't require, like you said, giving up your whole life and living in a temple, uh, but practicing communicating with God and learning to know what he sounds like so that when he does speak to you or show up with you, you recognize, you recognize his voice because you've been cultivating that relationship. So, uh, Corey, I know that you have some women that you want to talk to us about as well that also come out of Luke, and we'll find them in other places, but who do you yeah. want to talk about today? Yeah, absolutely. Luke talks about the most women in the New Testament. We see him lift up a lot of women in Jesus' ministry, and the ones that I relate to or connect with the most are Mary and Martha. And so this is the other Mary. This is Mary, <coughs> excuse me, Mary, not the mother of Jesus. Mary, not Magdalene, but Mary, sister to Martha and to Lazarus. When it comes to Mary and Martha and Mary and Mary and all the other Marys, all the other people that start with M, how can you tell the difference between Mary and Martha? Like, which is which? Yeah. <laughs> I think every time that I talk about Mary and Martha, people are confused and they can't remember which one is which. So um, if you take a look at the, the screen, there's um, a really white Jesus. <laughs> um, <laughs> but <laughs> this picture gives us a really good display of the, the distinction between Mary and Martha. And so the way that I remember which one's Mary is that Mary is with the other Marys, and the other Marys are with the disciples. So we see Mother Mary with the disciples. We see Mary Magdalene with the disciples. And as you can see in this picture, we literally see Mary on the floor sitting with the disciples, listening to Jesus. And Martha is the one standing up, looking over her shoulder um, in frustration because they are at, at Martha's home. And Martha is trying to be a good hostess. She is doing what she knows to be important. Um, she is serving them. She is preparing a meal for them. And she's annoyed that her sister is not. Mm -hmm. And so boldly, Martha turns to Jesus and says, Jesus, shouldn't Mary be helping me? And she doesn't get the response that she, that she wants. Instead, Jesus says, there is really only one thing worth being concerned about. Mary has discovered it, and I won't take it away from her. So if you haven't already figured out, Mary has discovered that what is, what is most important, what is worth being concerned about is Jesus. Jesus is present in this space and that is clearly the most important thing and Mary recognizes that. Now on the flip side of this, what Martha's doing is not unimportant. And we know that not only because we understand that, well, eating is important and being a good host is important, but we see it in the language that is used um, in the Gospels, and particularly in this story in Luke. The word that is here is called diakoneo, and it's the word that's, that's, that's used to describe the serving that Martha is doing in this passage. Um, and we see it throughout the Gospels, but when we see it throughout the Gospels, it is, it is describing the work that women do and what Jesus does. And it particularly comes up when Jesus says, I have come to be served. No, <laughs> rephrase. <laughs> <laughs> I have come not to be served, but to serve. And when he says to serve, he uses that same word, that diakoneo. 
And so we see that this is what Jesus calls all of us to do, is this serving. And Martha exemplifies that in this story. But what's, what's special about Mary in this is that she recognizes that though that is important, right now there's something more important, and that is sitting at the feet of her Savior. And we see that same discernment, that same wisdom from Mary in another passage that we find in John. And this is a story that you should be familiar with if you have done, if you have followed along with our readings. We actually preached on it a few weeks ago. Um, but it's the story where this woman breaks open a jar of expensive perfume and anoints Jesus with it. And in some of the other Gospels, in most of the Gospels, this woman is unnamed. She is identified as a sinner. I think in one of them she's identified as a prostitute. Um, but in the Gospel of John, it's identified as Mary, sister of Martha and Lazarus. And Mary, in this story, breaks open the bottle of perfume, and she washes Jesus' feet with it, which is a sign of honor to Jesus. It's a sign of worship to Jesus. And, and she's excited about it, and Jesus is excited about it, and the disciples are not. And they are not excited about it because here's this bottle of expensive perfume that in their eyes was just wasted. And it could have been sold and used as money to provide for people to serve in this diaconeo way, right? Um, but Jesus disputes this. He tells them, you don't understand. <laughs> Mary gets it. I'm with you now, but I will not always be with you. And I've been spending all this time telling you, I'm going to die. I'm going to be crucified on the cross. And, and they don't really get it yet. They don't understand it, which is understandable because Jesus speaks to them in parables. And so it's confusing. When he says, I'm going to die, like, great. But what do you really mean by that? Um, so it's understandable that they don't quite get it. But Mary has this, has this piece of wisdom that somehow sets her apart. Um, that she recognizes this is, this is a moment to be savored, this is a moment to remember, and this is a moment to honor my Savior in a way that other people were not willing to do. She is willing to step outside of the cultural norms, outside of her social expectations, and she does so even when it's at great risk. Yeah. So when you think about, Corey, when you think about Mary and Martha and uh, their story and kind of what we learned about them in the gospel, if there's something that every single one of us could take with us today, no matter who we are, no matter what we came in here with, when we look at Mary and Martha, what is something that every one of us can take out of here from, from what you've shared with us? Yeah. Um, I've been thinking about this. <laughs> there's, there's a lot of different things that you can learn from them. Um, but I think we, we always talk about Martha and Mary, and we often think of Mary as the good one, the one who's doing right, and Martha as the one who's not doing what Jesus wants her to, right? Um, but when I think of Mary and Martha, I think of it as, as me. <laughs> because from one minute to the next, I'm torn between both of those positions, right? The position of doing physical, tangible serving in relationship with Christ, in relationship with Christ's people, um, and on the other hand, being in, in direct relationship spiritually and sitting at the feet of Jesus and finding time in the Bible. And, and the truth is that both of those are crucial to living in the kingdom of God, to being in relationship with Jesus and the community of God. Yeah, yeah that's great. That's great. Um, so another thing that you kind of pointed out to us was that in the Gospel of John, we know that this Mary who washed Jesus' feet, we know that it was Mary who was the sister of Martha and Lazarus. But in other Gospels, we read about this woman who broke open the jar, who uh, anointed Jesus, and we don't know her name in the other Gospels. And it just reminds us that there are a lot of people, men and women alike actually, who have little kind of blips and little stories, and we don't necessarily know their name. And there's a couple of these that I just kind of are kind of unfortunate. Like for example, the woman who's caught in adultery, like for how many of us is it our worst nightmare that we'll be known by the worst day of our life, you know? So like for 2,000 years, here's how we know her, the woman who's caught in adultery. And I imagine when, she's get, when we get to heaven, she's gonna be like, guess what? My name is Sarah. <laughs> and from now on, you can call me Sarah. <laughs> You know, uh, but there are others like that. There's the woman at the well. That's uh, kind of neutral. No big deal there, right? But then another one that's just unfortunate. Nobody wants to be known like this for 2,000 years is the woman who had the bleeding disorder for 12 years. And that's how we know who she is. And I know, Anna, you wanted to talk with us a little bit about her as well. 
Yeah, I get to talk about the bleeding woman because not everyone can have as great as a name as Anna. <laughs> so anyways, we're going to look at the bleeding woman. And we know that she suffered from a disease that made her bleed for 12 years. And from the Old Testament, historically, traditionally, a woman that were bleeding or who were on their period, they would have been seen as unclean. So they would have had to leave society and go and pretty much quarantine themselves because they feared that they could have also made other people unclean from bleeding. And so we can also assume that this was probably the same for the bleeding woman. She probably not only suffered from this chronic disease for 12 years, but she probably suffered in complete isolation. So scripture tells us that for 12 years she suffered. And Luke specifically tells us that she suffered and no one could heal her. And at this point we can stop and we can think maybe I relate to her a little bit more. Maybe you have a chronic disease that you are dealing with. Maybe you have an illness that you're dealing with that it feels like no one can heal you. You just can't get past. Or maybe there's broken relationships in your life that cause you to grieve or cause, cause you to feel like you are in isolation. And maybe you are in this season, whether it's 12 years, it's just a season, it's a month or however long it is, it can be really hard. Mm -hmm. And you can start to lose hope. But with the bleeding woman, she never lost hope, even after 12 years with no one able to find a cure. Because she heard about this man who was going to be doing miraculous healings. He'd been um, healing so many people. And instead of saying, well, no one can heal me, she said, maybe this is the time that I can be healed. So she made her way back into city, back into society. She fought through a crowd just to touch his garment and through this hope, through her faith, she was immediately healed. The bleeding immediately stopped. So Anna, we, we see lots of healings, especially in the New Testament. We see Jesus heal this woman. We see him heal the blind and give them sight. We see him heal um, a paralyzed man, probably I think multiple times, bring people back from the dead. What is it about this particular story that makes it different or makes it stick out to you? So this healing is actually a healing trifecta. <laughs> there is the physical healing. When she fought through the crowd, went up to touch him. And it's not that it was like a magical touch. Scripture kind of sometimes makes it feel that way. It's not like she touched this magical piece of clothing. It was that the healing power of God that had been appointed to Jesus flowed through her, or flowed through him to her so that she could be healed in that moment. So there was the physical healing. And then when this happens, Jesus stops everything that he's doing. He stops the people around him and he says, who touched me? And this wasn't to rebuke her. This was because he knew someone around him had such great faith. But he said, who touched me? And she stepped forward. It says she, she was trembling. She stepped forward with appropriate response of reverence and awe of this healing miracle that just happened to her. And she said, it was me. And then we see a social healing. Because everyone around her at that moment now knew she was no longer unclean. She could be entered back into society. So a physical, social healing, and then finally also a spiritual healing. When Jesus says, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. As a response to her faith, she received the best gift possible of peace. She was physically healed, socially healed, and spiritually healed in that moment. It's really beautiful. So Anna, again, I'll ask you the same question. When you think about Anna the prophet, when you think about this woman, uh, and for every single one of us that's listening to this, what is one thing that we can take with us this week and, and uh, you know, be reminded of as we, as we head out into our week? One thing that I think the bleeding woman teaches us, especially when we're looking at the Gospels and we see so many other healing stories, is that healing sometimes can look different for everyone. Sometimes we think, I will be healed with this specific outcome and when it looks like X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. Where in reality, um, as pastors, we get the opportunity to, the, the great privilege and also some of the most challenging times to sit with some of our congregation when you're in the hospital or to sit with families when they are in hospice care. And sometimes healing looks so different than we can imagine. And that's because God knows exactly what we truly need to find healing. So she, when the bleeding woman went to Jesus, she wasn't expecting to be healed in all these different ways. Just like sometimes when we open our heart up to healing, we can't even expect or imagine the way 
that God is going to heal us in that moment. That's so true. Great, thank you. As we look then at these women that that, um, are in the New Testament that we've learned a little bit more about this morning, we see how their faith gave them courage to step out and to do the things that, that they were called to do, to, to step into being the people that Jesus had created them to be. And we, ne- we don't even necessarily have to know their name, right? <clears throat> For every single one of us who are sitting here today, like I look out at you and I recognize so many of your faces, but I don't know all of your names. And it's not important that we be known by everyone. What is important, though, is that we're known by the one, the one who went to the cross for us, the one who died for us and who does not regret it, the one who knows every single thing about us, every single thing, and extends out his hand and just invites us to take it, to allow him to remind us of who we are and whose we are. And allow him to remind us that we were created for so much more than all the things that we get stuck in. We so easily get stuck in fear and despair and worry and sorrow and boredom sometimes even, right? But Jesus says, if you will just, if you will just let me tell you who you are, if you will just give those things over to me, then Jesus says, I want to replace all of that with my peace and with my grace and with my forgiveness and with my love. And I want to replace all of these things that are sucking your life out of you. And instead, I want to give you a rich and satisfying life. That's the promise that Jesus makes to us. As we prepare to close today, there's one more little clip from The the Chosen that I want to show to you. And what you're going to see, this is not something that you are going to find in the Gospels. And I want you to understand that right now. Uh, This is an imagining uh, based on the authors of The Chosen. They imagined how Mary might have responded to Jesus' healing. And it's beautiful because, first of all, it's done in a really faithful way. But I want you to kind of, as you see this, look at Mary, and you're going to notice that she does not have it all figured out. She doesn't, she does not totally understand what has happened to her. But what she knows beyond a shadow of a doubt is that she was sick, and she needed healing, and she got it. And she responds to that generosity that she's been given, and she thinks it might have something to do with God, but but to be honest, she's not sure yet. And so she responds to this generosity and this healing that she's been given. And so then she, she responds to that by being generous with others. And uh, what we're going to see is she is hosting a Sabbath dinner. She doesn't know how to do this. She's so nervous about this, but she is willing to try. She's willing to try. She's willing to invite people in and be generous with them. And so as they sit down to dinner, they're about ready to start, and there's a surprise guest. So take a look. Like I said, you are very popular. Or it's a Pharisee here to shut us down for letting you be here. Hello, Mary. Hello. It's good to see you. Yes. Yes. I don't want to be rude, but would it be okay if, if I... Oh, <laughs> yes, of course, please come in. I just never thought you'd um, uh, I have guests here. Uh, this is my first time. I don't know what I'm doing. Rabbi, Rabbi. You already know these men? They are students of mine. I trust they have been polite. Of course. Your guests can take the seat, yes, Mary? Oh, of course. <laughs> yes, of course. Please have a seat. I keep saying of course a lot. <laughs> um, Francis is the man I told you about who, um, who helped me. Oh. I'm so sorry. I, I, I don't actually know your name. I'm Jesus of Nazareth. Mary, I'm honored to be here. Why don't you begin? Oh, no, I, I couldn't know that you are here. You must. Thank you, but this is your home. And I would love for you to do it. Okay. So there's a couple of things from that clip 
that I want us to kind of take out of here with us. First of all, again, this is an imagining. It's a faithful imagining of what this might have, something that might have happened, could have easily happened. But I want you to notice how, as I said, Mary didn't know what she was doing. But when you watch that, you really are made aware of the fact that that didn't bother Jesus at all. Jesus wasn't one bit concerned about the fact that Mary didn't have every little detail exactly right. And with what we can read about Jesus in the scripture, even though this is an imagining, it tracks with who Jesus is and how Jesus approaches every single one of us. He's so not concerned, (laughs) not concerned that we get every little thing right, but it matters so much more that our heart is open to what it is that he wants to do in us, what he wants to do through us, what he wants to do for us. And then the other thing I want us to kind of focus our attention on as we think about Mary and we think about her story and we think about our stories and we think about how Jesus showed up to remember, no matter what, my friends, that there is nothing that you can do to separate yourself from the love that God has for you through Jesus Christ. Paul tells us that there is nothing, not heaven nor hell, not angels or demons, not our fears, our worries, literally nothing in this life can separate us from the love that God has for us. And I think that for human beings, one of the hardest things we will ever have to do is to step in and claim the truth of who God says we are, that we are his, that he loves us so much that he would not be separated from us. He loves us so much that he sent Jesus to take care of this thing, this sin and death that we simply cannot take care of on our own. And the only reason he does that is because of his deep and abiding love for us. And all that we are asked to do is to believe that it might actually be true, even for me, even for you to let go of those things that we've been hanging on to, like the bleeding woman, like Mary, uh, like so many of us have so many things that we're hanging on to that we think are separating us from God, but there is nothing. If you look at that list, heaven, hell, angels, demons, life, death, fears, or worries, there is nothing that is outside of that list, my friends, nothing. So whatever it is that you're thinking is separating from you, separating you from God, it just simply is not. You are loved. You are are known, you are seen and valued by the one who went to the cross for you, for you, because he loves you so much. What we learned from some of these women today is that when we receive that gift of grace and forgiveness and mercy and love, then those are the things that come out of us. And it's one of the beautiful things about being able to gather together to worship weekly, whether we do it here in this room, whether you do it uh, at a different campus, whether you do it from your living room. But even though you may not be in this room, we are collectively gathered together to worship. It is our praise coming out because of what God has done for us because of the love that he's lavished on us. It's all worship from the, uh, from the singing to the Bible reading to the preaching to all of it, it's all worship. But there's a reason particularly that we close with a song. We close with the opportunity to lift our praises up because even if we don't know what to sing, we have words that we can sing along, we can hum along, we can think them if singing isn't your thing. But it gives us words that we can lift back up and praise to God because of the incredible love that he's lavished on us and the fact that he, uh, if I could crack open your head and your heart. (laughs) Oh man, (laughs) just to let you know how deeply you're loved. We get our whole life to explore it. To, to look for it, to look for the borders. Do it, look for them. You're never gonna find them. So as we prepare to sing, I'll just close with another thing that Paul said. May you understand how high and how wide and how deep and how long his love is for you. And because of his love, let's stand and let's worship him.